Josh Boyer was sentenced to 24 years in prison and he came out stronger than ever. Today, we're going to hear his story. Josh, thanks so much for being a part of the Prison Professors team. We're glad to have you. Glad to be here, Michael. So Josh is really an exceptional, exceptionally knowledgeable about the law. And just in this introductory episode, I'd like Josh to tell us a little bit about your experience, what brought you into the prison system, and how did you become su such an expert in understanding how uh, post-conviction litigation procedures? Well, I guess it happened by accident. I'm sure a lot of us end up getting in trouble by accident. We don't really mean to, to do it, but uh, at 23, I ended up getting involved in a sting operation uh, with the ATF. I was foolish enough to go to trial instead of taking a guilty plea because I didn't realize that I really didn't stand a chance of beating the government unless I had, you know, four or $500,000 to go to trial with. So, well, even then that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to beat the government, but certainly so if you don't have money, it's a, it's a setback. Towards, towards a million dollars to actually have, you know, what they would consider a, a legitimate federal trial. I mean, and that's just for any single defendant. So it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But, so, so you, you did go to trial, I presume with a federal defender? Yes. Yes. And you're convicted at trial, and, and tell us about the experience. What, wh where did you go, and how did you do your adjustment? Well, I started out in Tampa, uh, went through Atlanta, as many people do. I'm sure you, you were there for you know quite a few years. Uh, I, saw, I was in the general population there right after the Cuban riot in 1988. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've heard so many stories about that over the years, but I guess we can save that for another one. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like anything else, you know, I, I knew that what had happened was really bizarre. It didn't seem to sit well with me, aside from the fact that I'd just been sentenced to 24 years in the U.S. District Court in Tampa. So I started out trying to learn about, you know, this crazy and bizarre world that I found myself in so I could become knowledgeable instead of relying on other people. To how, how early in the sentence were you when you made that decision? Immediately. So you started, started hanging out in the law library. And what was your educational background before you started doing this work? I just had a uh, GED that I had, you know, that I'd gotten. I'd gotten kicked out of high school at a young age because I was a knucklehead and uh, just went back, got my GED. So you got your GED in prison or before prison? Before. So then when you get to prison, you start hanging out in the law library. And what do you start doing? Back then it was books. You know, we didn't have Lexus and Westlaw. It was just stacks upon stacks of books. I, I started reading cases. I started reading different briefs that guys, attorneys had filed that came to me that were asking me questions about it because they saw me in the law library six to eight hours a day every day. Uh, so I guess I just sort of like figured out what I thought was effective, mimicked the different techniques, you know, that I, that I saw different attorneys use to write briefs and you know, I started writing briefs for myself and then eventually started writing briefs for, for other people. And when you say you were writing briefs, were those direct appeals? Were they 20, were they uh, habeas corpus petitions? Were they Bivens actions? Were they, what were they? Actually, uh, you know, eventually it became a little bit of everything. Uh, That's um, great. That's yeah. great. So why don't we start by helping people understand the very different concepts of post-conviction litigation. So after there is a sentencing hearing, is it, I'd like you to help us understand, once the judge says, I hereby sentence you to the custody of the attorney general, what level, after he does that, what level of jurisdiction does that district court judge have over the individual? Well, you've got, a, you've got a certain time that you can file a notice of appeal. I think they changed the rule. It used to be shorter, but it's 14 days now, I believe, to, to actually let the court know that you want to take an appeal of your sentence of your conviction to a United States Court of Appeals. And once you file that appeal, the, the district court pretty much has you know limited ability to act afterwards, unless you're filing some sort of post-trial motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence or something. And, and usually a lot of people don't do that because they don't have access to that sort of information. And the federal defender's office is really isn't going to do a whole lot of digging to see if there's other evidence that they missed the first time around. So it's, I think it's important for people to understand what you just told them. <clears throat> and that is a district court judge 
is the finder of fact. And that is where they're going to determine guilt or innocence. And there's going to be a series of procedures and processes that take place that go all the way through the guilty plea, the, the pre-sentence investigation report, the sentencing hearing. And after that, it goes to a different court. And, and Josh called them the Court of Appeals, also known as the Circuit Court. The Circuit Court, what are they doing? Are they, I want you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm just going to ask you the question. In the Circuit Court, do you have the ability again to try and argue guilt or innocence, or what are you trying to accomplish on that direct appeal to the circuit court? Well, since 97 or 98% of federal cases are resolved in a guilty plea, that usually means that, you know, if a defendant is filing an appeal, he's probably dissatisfied with the length of the sentence or different aspects of the sentence. So it's going to be limited. What the, what the a three circuit, uh, three panels, so three judges on the panel. That's okay. <laughs> a three judge panel in the circuit court will uh, review whether or not, you know, the district court abused its discretion or made a clear error when it applied the law to the facts and determining different factors under the sentencing guidelines to control the sentence. Most, most of the time it's going to be a guidelines issue. Um, very rarely do they sentence above like a statutory maximum, you know, that, that would actually so the, the key takeaway there is that what the judge, the three judge panel that sits on the circuit court, what they're doing is reviewing whether the judge on the lower level court, the district court level, really followed due process or whether he abused discretion or whether there's something that, they, that, that he did inappropriately. The judges are really fucking, they're not going back and forth and saying whether there's innocent or guilt. And if they are on a, on a direct appeal that somebody went to trial like Josh did or I did, then they're going to be looking at the same thing, due process. Was there, uh, did the prosecutors reveal all the exculpatory evidence? Did they, was there prosecutorial misconduct? That, that kind of thing. Is that right, Josh? At, that's what happens at the circuit court? They're reviewing this, the district court? Definitely. And it's, it's really deferential. They're extraordinarily deferential to decisions that district court judges make. So nine times out of 10, if there isn't just some like completely and totally egregious error, they're going to, even if they find an error, they're going to say, oh, well, look, you know, uh, we may not have done it that way, but the district court had discretion, you know, to select the appropriate sentence so forth and so on so it, it's a really deferential standard of review it's difficult to win a direct appeal and so i think it's important for people who are going into the system to really understand what their what what level of difficulty they have trying to prevail first of all at the district court but if they don't prevail there how much more difficult it's going to be at the circuit court and then there's only one other place to turn after that and that's the u.s supreme court can you tell us a little bit about the procedure to try to get from the district court, if you don't like the district court's appeal, to go to the, uh, the, uh, cert, the, the Supreme Court? What's that process look like? Well, if, uh, if there's an adverse decision by the three-judge panel that we just discussed in terms of making a decision in, in a given appeal, uh, you can either file for a panel rehearing or rehearing en banc, which is basically ask all the members of the court to, you know, what, if the issue is important, if there's a split. Um, and aside from just those three judges, if other judges would like to rehear it, which they normally don't, then you can actually file a, a petition for writ of certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. And that's like asking permission to bring an appeal to the highest court in the land. Isn't that right? Definitely. And they grant less than 1% of cases that are filed in front of them and only a fraction of them are criminal cases. So it's really a, a long haul if you're going to try to plead not guilty and you're convicted at trial. There's a long call to justice. If you've pleaded guilty, what we heard from Josh is you're probably going to be appealing the federal sentencing guidelines. It, that's the only way you'd be involved with a circuit court. But there's another process which could be pursuing a 2255, and I would like it if you could help our audience understand what is a 2255, Josh, and how does it influence their, their, their journey? A 2255 basically is today's statutory equivalent of habeas corpus. It's a form of collateral review, and most defendants 
are going to raise some issue with the representation that they received, that their attorney was ineffective for failing to present evidence, in this case, for purposes of discussion at sentencing, that could have netted them a lower sentence. And that's going to be reviewed under the rubric of what's commonly known as ineffective assistance of counsel. And tell us about the, the very famous case Strickland versus Washington and how that applies to an ineffective assistance of counsel claim. Well, Strickland was one of the big cases that laid out the uh, deficient performance and prejudice prongs, basically saying deficient performance that the attorney's performance fell below a standard of objective reasonableness. And even if you show that the attorney's performance was deficient, you still have to prove prejudice, which is a reasonable likelihood that the outcome of the proceedings would have been different had the attorney done X, Y, or Z. And how difficult is it to overcome that challenge of Strickland versus Washington? It is. It, it's extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult because they set such a high bar for prejudice. Now, it's not impossible. I have seen people prevail. I've, I've seen a great number of people prevail. But, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely no walk in the park. And that's why we need to have an expert like Josh Boyer helping us or at least being a, a, a consulting guide to people who are trying to pursue this path. It's not something that somebody wants to try right off the bat because you've got how many, how many times have you helped people with various forms of either direct appeal or habeas corpus petitions during the 17 years you served in federal prison, Josh? What would you estimate? Probably a couple of hundred. I mean, I, it has to be at least that. I mean, I, you right. lose track of the years, but you lose track. Not and but and and every one of those, you know, you talk about law is the practice of law. It's actually reading all of the cases. It's doing all of the work. And the seventeen years that he served in prison has made him him an invaluable resource for anybody who's trying to approach the judicial system. And right now, as we're filming this episode, and as you've been so helpful to us with uh, prison professors. You're also really involved in this other form of, of, uh, of requesting relief, and that would be the 3582 pursuit, which is compassionate release, and also the 2241 pursuit, which is uh, challenging the, the, uh, the constitutionality of confinement. I'd love it if you could tell our audience a little bit about both the 3582 and the 2241 and what differentiates the two. Well, it's interesting because Prior to the passage of the First Step Act, which just sort of happened uh, late 2018, early 2019, when it finally got passed, once you filed a 2255, even if you had an extraordinarily long sentence, there wasn't any recognized vehicle for the judge to actually go back and reconsider your sentence, even if they felt it was excessive later on for any reason. But the good news is, when they did pass the First Step Act, they made some changes to the statute you just referenced, 3582. And basically now district courts, rather than the sentencing commission, had the ability to interpret language in that statute, which basically gives the court discretion under extraordinary and compelling circumstances to reduce a sentence. And we're in extraordinary and compelling circumstances right now because we've got federal judges closing down federal prisons. Tell us a little about what you've learned about this COVID pandemic and how courts are responding. There's an exhaustion requirement uh, that normally, if you're like you talked about Bivens earlier, we talked about 2241, uh, that requires basically prisoners to present an issue regardless of how serious it is all the way up the administrative chain in the Bureau of Prisons to the warden, to the regional office, to the central office. Prior to COVID-19, they didn't relax that standard at all. If you failed anyone to meet any one of those steps of administrative review, they would just kick your petition out of court and they wouldn't even look at it. Now, because of COVID-19 and the emergent circumstances that have kind of emerged, courts are, <laughs> guys are going straight into court and basically getting review without having to even present the issue to the Bureau of Prisons. Now, I'm not saying that I would advise everybody to do that. However, if it's an emergent situation, if there's, if there's somebody in there that's suffering from an underlying medical condition that needs immediate attention, given the spread of, the, of this virus and how deadly it's been, you don't want to wait 30 days. And courts really are realizing now that, hey, look, we're going to relax the standard and 
we're going to go ahead and deal with this in the first instance rather than require this inmate to present this to the Bureau of Prisons first. Well, interesting. You just said 30 days. My experience in administrative remedy is a little bit longer. What is your experience and how long it takes to exhaust that administrative remedy? It could take six months. Um, yeah. The only reason that I mentioned the 30 days is, is that's the language that was incorporated into the statute. And it's one way that Congress was concerned about how these guys that were sick even prior to COVID-19 that wanted compassionate release because of a uh, terminal medical condition, they didn't want their paperwork getting lost in the process and them not having a vehicle to go into court and getting held up by the BOP and potentially not having anybody resolve their issue. So they, they did set a, a 30 day window in the new statute. And that 30 day window though still requires them to go. That's after the six months. So it's actually worse than the six months for administrator. It's first Terrible. exhaust your administrator and then wait 30 days. Then, then you file in court. But now you're saying that's been excused or relaxed, at least it, in some courts. It's been excused in such a great number of cases. I mean, if we look back on the 30 years where the exhaustion requirement comes from is litigation or sorry, legislation referred to as the Prison Litigation Reform Act. And that basically says before a prisoner is allowed to bring any type of suit into court that they want them to first present it to prison officials and give them an opportunity to resolve it administratively. Well, you've so, been an enormous resource in helping people understand that, Josh. What is your uh, resources? What are you using now that you're home to help people? Where do you go to find, when you were in prison, you had access to uh, the law library. Now that you're home, what are you using as a resource to help you build these cases? I'll tell you what, uh, Doug Berman over at uh, Sentencing Law and Policy, he's a law professor at Ohio uh, State University there. He's, he's got an awesome resource there on Sentencing Type Pad. You know, and, and he, him and a couple other guest bloggers, they post daily on there about compassionate release, about courts in, interpreting the extraordinarily compelling language that we just discussed, and especially on COVID-19 releases. So you're providing an enormous uh, amount of experience because the average layman wouldn't even know about uh, Doug, uh, Professor Berman's blog. In fact, we could pull it up right here just to show it into the screen. And, and, and what is it? It's, it's, um, I forgot the name of his blog. Sentencing Law and Policy. So we go to Sentencing Law and Policy and get a look at it. Sentencing Law and Policy. And there it is blogs pad i've seen it before and there he is every day you'll notice there is a new there is a new case some exhausted musings on the so-called exhaustion procedure requirement for sentence reduction motions under 3582 c1a so every day we've got new content up here and uh it's really important for people to be reviewing this document if they're going to be pursuing uh their own legal research so this is your primary source here of where you're getting con getting information what else are you using I use Bloomberg a lot too. Uh, it basically, it's what gives you docket access. You can just go in there. You use and, that rather than Pacer? Yeah, yeah. Is, actually, is this a free service or do you have to subscribe? <laughs> you have to subscribe, but I mean, that's the, the, the benefit of having, you know, friends that, that do this. You know, I, I get to kind of like piggyback on their account. Right on, right on. And so they have, is this as good as Lexus? It is. Um, Lexus doesn't really give you a full range access to the dockets. I think they're kind of selective in terms of the briefs and pleadings and stuff that you can access. But I mean, as we're hearing about all this stuff going on at, uh, at Elkton, at Oakdale in Louisiana, about the huge outbreaks in the, the mm -hmm. and they've got some really sad stuff happening there. But Elkton, just the other day, the federal judge over there in Ohio uh, issued a preliminary injunction, basically finding that as a preliminary matter that because they've failed, BOPs failed to implement social distancing and, you know, basically the hygiene requirements that are mandated by public health officials, that they're actually violating on a broad scale the Eighth Amendment right of the inmates there at Elkton. And, and explain it to, uh, to our audience who's not as familiar with the Constitution as we all should be, Eighth Amendment, and, and explain its relationship to cruel and unusual punishment. Well, yeah, yeah just like you said, Michael, um, the Eighth Amendment prohibits 
cruel and unusual punishment. In this case, it would be either deliberate indifference to safety or deliberate indifference to somebody's serious medical needs. If somebody had a serious underlying medical condition that would make them more susceptible to contracting and experiencing serious complications in light of COVID-19, they held that the space parameters, basically people are living on top of each other. They can't stay more than six feet away from the next guy. They don't have access to the chemicals and disinfectants that they need. The ventilation to, system. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like inviting some people with COVID-19 into your house, bringing everybody in a room, closing the doors and closing the windows and expecting that nobody's going to get it. It's ridiculous. Well, people who are striving to get justice for their loved ones would really, really be fortunate to work with uh, Josh Boyer. He, we consider him an outstanding resource at Prison Professors, definitely a team member for anybody who's facing challenges that needs some judicial help. And we use him as a resource, and we would encourage you to do the same thing as well. And you can tap into him just very simply contacting uh, our team member, Justin McPerney, who kind of coordinates these one-on-one -on -one calls. I'm just striving to provide as much information. I wanted to introduce Josh Boyer, uh, one of our prison professors who's an expert in, uh, really was an expert in litigation while he was serving time in prison. And if you need that help in your own uh, pursuit, you should certainly reach out and, and connect with Josh. So thanks so much, Josh. Michael, great talking to you.